I am the whistler. And I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadow. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. Tonight, transcribed, it's the whistler's strange story, Undercurrent. sea was smooth and the ship, the SS Java Queen, out of Vancouver for San Francisco, was moving calmly through it, and in the vernacular, all was well. But not so with a certain member of the cargo ship's half-dozen passengers. No, Chris Horton was anything but calm, for as he hurried along the deck, he knew that something was wrong, very wrong, and he intended to find out about it. He was determined to do so when he bumped against the deck steward carrying a tray of food. Oh, oh my fault, sir. Wasn't looking. Uh, where are you taking that tray? Why, uh, to Mr. Ashcroft, Kevin. Good. You ought to be the one person on board this ship who knows what he looks like. What he looks like? Well, certainly. But I, I don't just un- came from Ashcroft's cabin. There's a man in there who claims he's Ashcroft. Now, I know he isn't. What? What do you mean, sir? I've been bringing him his meals ever since we sailed. He's not a very good sailor, you know. Won't come on deck. I'm sure. Okay, that that's take a look right now. Find out what that guy in there is up to. You watch the steward walk away, Chris. Knock on the door of Ashcroft's cabin. Presently, it opens. The man inside takes the tray. And a moment later, the steward is back at your side. Um, uh, I don't get you, Mr. Horton. Unless you're trying to pull my leg. Well, you're all mixed up, sir. That's Mr. Ashcroft, all right. I know it is. Well, Chris, you thought the steward was going to agree, didn't you? But he's confused you even further. You pace the deck for a long while, thinking things out. Finally decide there's only one thing to do. And you hurry toward the captain's quarters. Come in. Captain, I'd like to talk to you. It's very important. Hey, of course. Come in, Mr. Horton. I'm going to shake hands with my friend, Mr. Ashcroft. Uh, what? We're just having a little drink. How do you do, Mr. Horton? Ah, what was it you wanted to see me about? Uh, 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 nothing. That is, uh, I guess it can wait. I'll talk to you later. It's a shock, isn't it, Chris? A terrible puzzle. A ship moving through a calm, smooth sea. But with a weird undercurrent crisscrossing in your mind. Because you know that the ship's captain and the deck steward are making a horrible mistake. Or they're deliberately lying. You stop suddenly, realize you're passing the radio shack. And there's someone inside you can trust. Reg McKenzie, a nice youngster. He could send a message for you, Chris. But to whom? And then your gaze falls on the ship's bulletin board. A typewritten sheet of paper. The news from shore. There's a brief paragraph. The sensational development in the Saletti murder case in San Francisco. And instantly a name comes to your mind. Stoddard. Lieutenant John Stoddard. A well-known police detective. A man known to you only by reputation. You hurry into the radio shack. Red. Huh? Oh, hi, Mr. Horton. I want you to send a message for me. Here. Hey, five dollars. You can earn it. You got a message blank? Yes, sir. Thanks. John Stoddard, Hall of Justice, San Francisco. S.S. Java Queen, docking tomorrow, 10 a.m. Meet me, Chris Horton. Yeah. Uh, S.S. Java Queen, docking tomorrow, 10 a.m. Meet me, Chris Horton. Sure, I'll get it off right away, sir. You feel better now, don't you, Chris? Relieved. But as you start down the companionway towards your own cabin, a thought strikes you, makes you hesitate and turn. Slowly, you make your way back to a position where you can observe the radio shack. 
Yeah. Sure enough, Chris. The radio man, a yellow message blank in hand, leaves the radio shack and goes straight to the captain's quarters. Now you're certain, Chris. They're all against you. And your message to Police Lieutenant John Stoddard has been turned over to the captain and will never be sent. In your cabin, you pace the floor and wonder and worry for hours into the night. And then as you decide to step out on deck again... What the devil? Locked. I'm locked in. It's a terrible night you spend, isn't it, Chris? A prisoner in your own cabin, unable to get out and get help from the other passengers. You stretch out on your bunk. It seems you've only dozed off, and then it's morning. You hurry to the porthole, look out, and see that the ship is docked. The cargo is being lowered away. You turn and start pounding on the door and shouting frantically. Let me out of here! Half an hour! Stuart! Something wrong, Mr. Horton? Wrong? How was I locked in like this? What's going on here? Why, this door wasn't locked, sir. Uh, Perhaps it just uh, jammed a little. Hmm? Jammed? Sure. Maybe it was just jammed. Moments later, you hurry ashore, hope frantically that the man who called himself Ashcroft hadn't disappeared. And suddenly you spot him just a few feet away, about to enter a taxi. You hear him give the driver a hotel address on Fulton Street and ride hurriedly away. You carefully note the address he gave and then rush to a drugstore near the docks. Yes? Linda, it's Chris. I just got in. Oh, Chris, what's happened? Why didn't you get in touch with me? Listen, baby, something's gone wrong. We better not talk now. Come to my apartment tonight. All right, Chris, but... Tonight, I said. Eight o'clock. Hello, Linda. Chris, Chris. Take it easy now. I've already fixed you a drink. I can use it. Maybe you can use another when you hear what I've got to say. You better sit down. I I did it, baby. Just like we planned. I killed him and set it up to look just like suicide. But when I went back to his cabin a few hours later to, well, to discover the tragedy, his body was gone. So? Yes. Somebody else was in the cabin. A stranger, Lynn. The guy I never saw before. He was posing as your husband. Said his name was Ashcroft. How could he? I don't know. But the steward backed him up. The captain, everybody. But why, Chris? What does it mean? I don't know, Linda. But we better find out. Quick. In just 30 seconds, the whistler will continue tonight's story. Don't be half right. Use Yusafi. For example, how long would you say a nautical mile is? 3,040 feet? No, that's only half right. Brush up on your marine navigation. Tell your I and E officer you want to study with the United States Armed Forces Institute, USAFI. It's easy. It's simple. If you don't want to be half right, use USAFI. And now back to The Whistler. It's a terrible, puzzling thing, isn't it, Chris? The events on shipboard. The discovery that someone, a stranger, was posing as Frank Ashcroft, the man you murdered. Now, back in San Francisco, sitting in your apartment with a victim's wife, lovely Linda Ashcroft, the two of you share the shock, stare at one another with eyes filled with questions. It's a horrible twist of circumstances on the aftermath of your perfectly planned murder. A plan that had its beginning some three months ago when you first met Linda, newly arrived from Canada, 
to find a home in San Francisco for herself and her wealthy husband. Now you're both caught in the undercurrent of a deadly mystery. Ashcroft is dead. You know that, Chris. You killed him with your own hands. But there's another man, a stranger in his place. What? What are we going to do, Chris? We're going to find out what he's up to, Linda. Before I called you this morning, I heard him tell the taxi driver to take him to a hotel on Fulton. You don't think we should go there? Okay. I do. And right now. Come on. <laughs> There's the hotel. Let's... Wait a minute, Linda. What's the matter? There he is. The guy getting into the cab. He doesn't even look like Frank. We'll just tag along and find out where he's going. He went into the park, Chris. Yeah, I know. What are you going to do? I'm going in after him. Chris, don't... Relax, relax, honey. I'll be all right. Wait here for me. You hurry into the park, down the darkened path after him, and then up ahead, a street lamp. And under it, sitting on a park bench, another man. There's something familiar about him, isn't there, Chris? Yes, it's the ship's steward. Just then, you see the man you've been following walk toward the steward. You move quickly through the trees, circle behind the park bench, and listen. Sit down, Mr. Ashcroft. You can forget that now. What's wrong? We've got a little talking to do, Mercer. The captain's been thinking it over. You know, smuggling aliens into the States is risky, isn't it? Yes, 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 yes. The captain thinks that job we did for you is worth a little more money. A bargain's a bargain. I, I, I paid what you asked. All right. The regular fee. But you got special treatment. First class accommodations, meals, and on top of that, we furnished you with a set of identification papers. All neat and proper like. You know, we took a big chance dumping that suicide overboard. How much do you want? Well, the captain figures Ashcroft's papers are worth at least 500. That's crazy. Okay. Then hand them over. We can always use them. No, 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 no. no. Wait, wait a minute. If you'll meet me here tomorrow night... I'll have the money for you. Sorry. I'll have to have it now. Tomorrow night you might not show up, mister. You might be halfway across the country. No, no, no. I wouldn't do that. Why I... should you stick around San Francisco? You don't know anyone here. All your friends are in the East. You must be rather anxious to join them. Look, I promise... Forget it. Now, let's have the money now. Hmm? All right. All right. <laughs> It's all quite clear to you now, isn't it, Chris? The conversation you've just overheard explains a lot of things. You know exactly what happened aboard ship last night and why. And now as you hurry back to Linda, you know you've nothing to worry about. And a plan is already beginning to take shape in your mind. What happened, Chris? Relax, baby. We're in great shape. Great shape. What do you mean? Our friend just met the ship's steward. You mean the same one? Yeah. Seems like the captain of the SS Java Queen and his boys are running a nice little rocket. Smuggling aliens into the States. A man who was posing as your husband is one of their clients. A guy named Mercer. I don't understand. Oh, it's simple, Linda. The steward went down to your husband's cabin, found him dead. Right away, he gets a bright idea. He removes all identification from the body... Dumps it overboard and sets up this man, Mercer, as Ashcroft. That seems like such a risky thing to do. Not particularly. The steward must have known your husband had no friends aboard. Besides, he stayed in his cabin all the time. It's a perfect setup. Huh? What are we going to do now? I think I've got that figured out, too. This guy, Mercer, doesn't know anyone here in town. How about your husband? Anyone know him? No, not a soul. I'm sure of it. Go ahead, go ahead. Now, suppose something happened to Mercer, an accident. He's carrying your husband's identification papers. An accident? A fatal accident. 
The police find him. You identify him as your loving husband, Frank Ashcroft. Oh, no, Chris. No, let's forget it. Forget the whole thing. Look, how are we going to get our hands on your husband's estate if we can't turn him up dead? There's got to be a body. First thing in the morning, I'll call the police. Report my husband missing. Listen, in a few years... Seven. He'll be declared legally dead. Sure. But I don't want to wait that long, Linda. Don't you see? The setup is perfect. You're the only one in town who can identify your husband. He didn't carry any insurance, so there won't be any investigation. Chris, I'm afraid... Don't be. There's nothing to worry about. Not a thing. Leave everything to me. A perfect setup, isn't it, Chris? An opportunity you can't afford to miss. You turn the car around. Drive back into the park. Drive down the road past the park bench. It's empty now. But up ahead, you see Mercer walking along the side of the road. Your foot presses down on the accelerator hard. Chris, what are you going to do? Take it easy, Linda. I said I'd handle it. No, Chris, no. We don't have to do this. Sure we do, baby. Sure we do. Good evening. Is Mr. Ashcroft at home? No, he's not. You a friend of his? Well, in a way. A shipboard acquaintance, you might say. We met on the job of Queen out of Van- uh, Vancouver. She docked this morning. I see. Well, is something wrong? I'm Sergeant Holmes, police. Mr. Ashcroft is dead. De- dead? Hit and run accident. Happened a couple hours ago in the park. Run? Oh, horrible. Came by to pick up Mrs. Ashcroft, take her downtown to make the formal identification. I see. <laughs> you know, I uh, just can't believe it. Ashcroft dead? Why, well, only last night we sat around, had a few drinks. We... Uh, Sergeant. Yeah? If I can do with any help. Yes, maybe you can. You can help with the identification from Morgan. I'm sure Mrs. Ashcroft won't mind. In here, Mrs. Ashcroft, Mr. Horton. Steady now, Mrs. Ashcroft. Go ahead, Sergeant. Drive you back home. Uh, never mind, Sergeant. Oh, what? Chris Horton. I'll just see the two of you to your car. You know, I became very well acquainted with your husband a few days aboard ship, Mr. Ashcroft. He's a fine man. Wonderful person. I'm sure we could have become great friends. Great friends. I'm sure you would have, Mr. Horton. Strange, really. I feel as though I, I've known him for many years. I feel a lot as keen as you do, Mr. Ashcroft. Sure, well, he's, he's gone now, but he's left something. Something for both of us. are proud of our hometowns, and rightly so. In this brief moment before we continue with our program, we'd like to offer a salute to one of our hometowns in America, Minneapolis, Minnesota. The 17th city in size in the United States, Minneapolis is the manufacturing, wholesaling, retailing, financial, and educational center of a vast region. And as Minnesota is the land of 10,000 lakes, 
Minneapolis is the gateway to that great recreational area. Inside the city itself are 22 lakes, which offer fishing, boating, canoeing, and sailboating in summer, ice boating and skating in winter. That's just a part of the Minneapolis park system that covers almost 6,000 acres. Minneapolis includes much of the history of America in its own history. It has seen French fur traders, British soldiers, Indian battles. 130 years ago, the government established a flour mill there. And today, Minneapolis is one of the outstanding flour milling centers of the world. It is also the largest distributing center for tractors and agricultural implements in the country. The people of Minneapolis are proud of its history, its beauty, and its progressive community spirit. They are also proud of the part Minneapolis has played in the building of America. And now, back to The Whistler. You're certain you're in the clear now. You and Linda, aren't you, Chris? Yes. She's just identified Mercer's body, the hit-and-run victim, as Frank Ashcroft, her husband. It'll all be over in a few days. There'll be a quiet funeral, a private funeral. Linda will inherit the Ashcroft estate, and the two of you will share it together. Now, as you follow the police sergeant out of the morgue, Linda holding onto your arm tightly, a man suddenly appears in the doorway, blocking your path. Good evening, Sergeant. Oh, good evening, Lieutenant. I understand you brought in Mrs. Ashcroft, a man named Horton. Yes, sir. This is Mrs. Ashcroft, and... Well, well, well. You're Mrs. Ashcroft. Well, this is a surprise. Last time I saw you and Horton here, the two of you were in a big hurry, Mrs. Ashcroft. Uh, just, just, just a minute. What is this? You know, you're a hard guy to trail, Horton. I've been trying to catch up to you since this morning. When I went down to the boat, they told me you'd already gone ashore. The, the boat? Well, yeah, you... I got your address there, but you haven't been home all day. When I came back tonight, you were gone, but the doorman was very helpful. Pointed you out as you were driving away in a yellow convertible. License number IR-7305. Oh, all right, but I still... I almost to... caught up with you then. But I lost you in the traffic on Fulton near the main entrance to the park. I picked you up again in the park. Just when you ran down Ashcroft. What? By the time I got to him, he was already dead. You beat it out of there. Finally, I find you here. You've been trailing me. Why? I'm Lieutenant Stoddard. He sent me a radiogram from the SS Java Queen. Asked me to meet you when she docked. Remember? Featured in tonight's transcribed story were Bill Foreman as The Whistler, George Neese, Gene Tatum, Jack Moyle, Gil Stratton Jr., Jack Edwards, and Chuck Mencken. The Whistler, directed by Gordon T. Hughes, with music by Wilbur Hatch, is produced by Joel Malone and transmitted overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service.